Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to our sixth Islamic Finance Lecture Series organized by Ibn Sam Saifur. For your knowledge, uh, this uh, program, which is the Islamic Finance Lecture Series, IFLS, is a yearly event organized by Ibn Sam Saifur as the initiative of the Center to promote Islamic knowledge, Islamic uh, finance uh, knowledge to students, to the lecturers, and all uh, And this program also is a platform where we want to, uh, what we call, uh, introduce the scholars, uh, the, the, the experts, in uh, Islamic finance, uh, uh, what we call uh, topics, so that their knowledge will be uh, shared uh, to everyone. Yeah. In this particular uh, series, which is the sixth series, uh, the topic that we have uh, chosen is uh, the role of Islamic social finance during the pandemic of COVID 19 crisis. Uh, and uh, the guest speaker is our own uh, senior lecturer from UNISHAM, uh, from Cypher, which is Associate Professor Dr. Yusuf Ali Osman. He's uh, one, of, uh, the prom uh, one of the prominent and uh, what we call distinctive uh, scholars in Islamic finance uh, in UNISHAM and also known uh, in, 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 in Islamic finance uh, uh, academic world. Um, I also would like to take this opportunity to, uh, to congratulate the organizing committee, which is uh, headed by uh, Dr. Omar Tahir. So, uh, congratulations because uh, you have made this program very uh, successful today. And uh, I also would like to say, to say thank you to all the participants which uh, support uh, this program. Inshallah, our plan is that uh, this year, 2021, we will organize uh, three more programs and inshallah we will also uh, get uh, speakers from the industry to, to, uh, sh uh, to share their knowledge and expertise in uh, Islamic Finance Lecture Series uh, program, inshallah. Uh, dear viewers, uh, we know that now uh, with the country and the world currently facing the outbreak of uh, COVID-19. Okay? So this uh, pandemic already causes many uh, what we call bad neg uh, or negative uh, uh, influence or impact on the individual, on the community, families and
Thank you, Encik Masri Azro Ben Nayan, the Director for the Center for Islamic Finance, uh, Education and uh, Research. Sultan Abdul Halim Muazzam Shah, International Islamic University, Unishan. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I will start my presentation for the uh, Islamic Finance Lecture Series number six. My name is uh, Yusuf bin Hadi Othman. I'm uh, one of the lecturers at the Center for Islamic Finance, Education and Research, Cypher, at the Sultan Abdul Halim Muazzam Shah International Islamic University. So we are joined today by more than 300 participants. However, due to a technical problem, only 100 uh, participants can join us using uh, Zoom webinar. However, uh, the rest of the uh, participants can join us uh, using um, Facebook, Yusuf Haji Osman Live. Okay, we have a beautiful, beautiful campus here in uh, Kuala Ketir. Uh, however, because of the COVID-19, uh, we are having class online and um, we have this um, Islamic Finance Lecture Series uh, online. This is our sixth uh, lecture series. And the previous lecture series was uh, held face to face. So this is the first time that we use the, um, the Zoom webinar uh, online. Okay, so right now, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Um, the pandemic crisis has affected all of us, everybody. We are surrounded by this um, so-called COVID-19 uh, virus. And um, we are trying to find the solutions to the problem. And inshallah today, um, we will discuss uh, the role of uh, Islamic uh, social finance in uh, reviving the economy, in providing employment and uh, security to the people during the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 has uh, kept challenge for all the countries around the world to find the solutions uh, to flatten the medical curve. And uh, we could think of the pandemic as a disruption, as a new norms. And uh, disruption means disturbance or problems which uh, interrupt an event, activity or process. Disruption by definition shakes the way of doing things and uh, accelerates change and transformation. So because of the COVID-19, we have to change, we have to adjust to the new norms. In other words, disruption introduces non-linear change in the world that up to that point could be said to be progressing linearly. So the nonlinear thinking is that uh, there are various solutions. There are many solutions instead of just one solution to revive the economy during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So we have to have nonlinear thinking 
uh, we have to have the um, paradigm shift. We have to have the out of the box. Let's try it again. Okay. Okay, so we have to have the nonlinear thinking, the um, Okay, can you hear me now? Mr. Sairada, can you hear me now? Mr. Ahmad, how are you? How are you doing? How are you? Can you hear me now? Yes, I know I can hear you clear. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We, so we can continue. So we are now uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And, yes. Uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 has kept challenge for countries around the world to find yeah. immediate solutions. And Alhamdulillah, in Malaysia, we Inshallah, we will receive the vaccine starting March next month, March 2021. Yes. So, so right now we have been uh, dealing with the uh, pandemic and uh, we could think of the pandemic as disruption. Disruption yes. means disturbance or problems which uh, interrupt an event, activity or process. Disruption by definition shakes the way of doing things. So we have to make the adjustment. We have to adjust to the new norms. And we have to be able to have the non-linear thinking. Non-linear thinking means the thinking to find various solutions to the certain problem. And the problem that we discussed today is to revive the economy during uh, the pandemic. And um, we have to have the non-linear thinking because um, to, to find solutions to this uh, big problem of uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis, there are many solutions, right? And we have to think out of the box. We have to uh, have the paradigm shift. And uh, many governments have introduced measures such as lockdown and partial lockdown in order to curb, in order to flatten the medical curve. And some countries have been successful while others have not been successful. And Malaysia, al Alhamdulillah, uh, since a couple of days, it, it looks like uh, we have been able to flatten the curve. But in the long run, the bigger challenge is there will be the recession curve that uh, some uh, economic experts uh, have predicted that uh, the longer the um, pandemic crisis, uh, the, the worse will be the, the economic uh, recession and, and uh, it might lead to economic uh, depression. So what's the problem with the lockdown? On one hand, it's been able to flatten the medical curve, but on the other hand, it creates the economic problem because the lockdown has created issues like uh, demand and uh, supply shocks that has uh, significantly affect the global economy in a negative way. And some experts uh, are predicting that it will lead, it will lead to uh, economic uh, depression.
So let's uh, look at the COVID-19 in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is one of the countries that was uh, early affected by the COVID-19. And the first case was detected on 23rd of January, 2020. Uh, at that time, the Ministry of Health received three reports of cases being affected by COVID-19, two in Sabah, one in Selangor. And uh, on the 25th of January, the first confirmed case to ban three Chinese citizens who entered Malaysia via Singapore on 23rd January, 2020. So it has been more than a year since the early detection of the COVID-19 case uh, in Malaysia. And uh, the, um, uh, let's look at the, the faces of the movement control order introduced by the Malaysian government. The first phase of MCO was from uh, 18 March to 31st March, for 14 days. The second phase from the 1st April to 14th of April. The third phase from 15th of April to 28th of April. The fourth phase of MCO from 29th to 3rd of May 2020. Phase five is called Conditional Movement Control Order from 4th of May to 11th of May 2020. And phase six, a conditional uh, movement control order from 12th of May to 9th of June. And phase seven, recovery movement control order, okay, from 10th of June to 31st of August. Phase eight, RMCO recovery movement control order from 1st of September to 31st of December 2020. Phase nine uh, recovery movement control order from 22nd of January to 4th of February 2020. And uh, phase 10 recovery movement control order from 19th February to 4th March. So that that's where we are right now. Okay, so what happened? What is the effect of the lockdown? We have introduced lockdown, but the effects of the lockdown is, uh, is that it, it leads to a recession. Uh, it, it leads to retrenchment. Some of the workers have been retrenched, especially in uh, industries which have been uh, adversely affected like uh, airline industry, maritime industry, the leisure, hotel industry, and other industries. So uh, unemployment is, um, is bad. It leads to the loss of income. Uh, it leads to the difficulty of families, difficulty of people to, to support the families. And uh, some of the uh, companies have to shut down the operations uh, because of the reduction in the domestic demand and also the reduction in the foreign demand. And there is a high cost to the government uh, because the government uh, needed to introduce some kind of a stimulus package in order to uh, help the people affected by the COVID-19, help them uh, survive. So it is very costly for the government. And there is a problem of foreclosure. Uh, you know, some, some people cannot afford to pay back their loans and uh, there is an attempt by the lender to recover the amount owed on the defaulted loan and the food crisis so this is what some uh, experts are worried about alhamdulillah it's not uh, happening in malaysia but um, 
we have to be prefer pre we have to prepare ourselves for the uh, food crisis. Um, we will talk uh, more on that later on, inshallah, if time permits, huh? inshallah. So how's uh, everybody doing? Ahmad, are you okay? Mr. Chairoda, are you following us? Yes, sir. We are for you. Alhamdulillah. Okay, you can ask questions and I will try to answer at the end of the uh, lectures, inshallah. Okay, let's look at the um, economics of COVID-19. There are some uh, industries who have been uh, adversely affected by this uh, COVID-19, especially uh, we have observed the uh, tourism and leisure industries, the hotels, uh, the motels, those uh, places like in Indonesia, Bali, in, in Thailand, um, those uh, places of tourism have been uh, shut down. Uh, aviation, the airline industries, uh, some of the airlines have uh, to shut down. There are many pilots, there are many airline staff who have been uh, retrenched. And automotive industries also have been uh, affected. The sales have uh, decreased. The construction and uh, real estate industries, the manufacturing sector, some of the uh, the firms, the manufacturing fir the manufacturing firms have to shut down, and uh, financial services also have been affected. Is is the sound okay, Mister Irodat? Is the sound okay? Yes. Yeah. Mashallah. Everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. Alhamdulillah. My apology for the technical uh, problem today. It's okay, Professor. You know, like we learn, like once we go through the session, we learn a lot of things. So that's inshallah for the next time, there won't be any sort of problem, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. So among the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on the economy is the manufacturing industries are cutting down productions, employees are losing jobs, and so they have the problems of uh, losing the income. So this is a huge problem for them to support the family. And governments are also struggling, you know, by having to introduce some kind of stimulus package uh, to safeguard employment and to safeguard the livelihoods of the people in order to reduce the adverse effects of the COVID-19. And all this turns into what we call the pan pandemic crisis. So in order to fight the pandemic crisis, uh, many governments have introduced st stimulus packages to channel the funds to people so that the people have enough money to spend, even if some of them have not been working. So that is a big challenge because in the long term, uh, the introduction of the stimulus package will increase the government debt and the future generations will have to bear the responsibility to, to pay back the government debt. So we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, since it, it has been about a year, and we have seen that uh, the COVID-19 has demonstrated its uh, pandemic power. So these uh, adverse uh, e events include uh, disruptive economic scenarios where it leads to uh, the slowdown of the economic activities, it leads to the increase in uh, unemployment, the increase in inflation, uh, the inability of the people to support their family, and um, uh, 
is 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 uh, is been uh, really uh, really bad, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we can find ways to to help those people uh, by using the Islamic social finance. So that is our topic. So we we want to uh, we want to talk about the role of Islamic social finance. So what is the role of Islamic social finance in supporting the employment? That's very important. Losing jobs have the psychological effects on the people. You know, they not only have the, the um, problems of trying to uh, survive, support the family, but also there is um, you know, some kind of uh, psychological psychological problems, you know. So, so what is the role of Islamic social finance in supporting uh, the employment and uh, in, in stimulating and reviving the economy of the countries? So um, there is a need to do research on uh, linking uh, Islamic social finance and uh, and uh, develop instruments of Islamic social finance in creating employment opportunities and reviving the economy during COVID-19 pandemic. So we will talk uh, in more detail about each of the instruments of the social Islamic social finance. So what is Islamic social finance? So when the the Islamic social finance is like it's like the uh, it, it's like Islamic finance itself. Um, it involves the surplus uh, unit who uh, who contributes the funds and is used by the uh, deficit unit, uh, and then and then it has some kind of uh, uh, objectives or, or, or rewards. So in Islamic social finance, uh, the objective is uh, to help society. So to, to, to create uh, the maslaha for the society. So the Islamic social finance uh, sector includes Islamic institutions based on charity, uh, based on philanthropy, such as zakat, sadaqah, and waqaf. And it also includes uh, some kind of social investments through sukuk, Islamic crowdfunding, and uh, Islamic microfinance. So today we will talk about the six instruments of Islamic social finance, zakat, sadaqah, waqaf, uh, sukuk, Islamic crowdfunding, and uh, Islamic microfinance. I'm sure you have lots of questions, huh? so you can um, ask questions later, inshallah. So Islamic social finance is not something new, although the term is new, but the, but the concept is not new. So it is a, a tool to finance the society, which uh, has been used since the early years of Islamic government. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, zakat was used as the main revenue to the government and it was used to uh, support uh, government projects including providing um, clean water and sanitation uh, to the people. So zakat, uh, sadaqah, waqaf, Islamic crowdfunding, Islamic uh, microfinance and uh, and sukuk. So those are the six um, so-called uh, Islamic social finance instruments that uh, we will discuss today. And uh, I think it's, it's very important to examine these uh, Islamic social finance instruments and uh, the purpose of the Islamic social finance, there are many purposes. Um, and uh, I think that 
two of the main objectives are to protect the people and empower the people. How do we protect and empower the people? By providing them jobs, by providing them uh, income uh, security, right? And the second aim or purpose of Islamic social finance is to revive and uh, to stimulate the economy. And if we read the history in the, of the Islamic uh, government, zakat was used uh, during the time of Khalifa Omar ibn Aziz to alleviate poverty. And uh, it was uh, recorded that Omar ibn Aziz was very successful in uh, utilizing zakat until there was no zakat recipients of that time. You know, zakat cannot be distributed to asnaf because there was no asnaf at that time. So, so this uh, it shows that uh, zakat, if utilized properly, can be used uh, to achieve certain objectives like um, elimination of poverty. Um, elimination of hunger, um, providing a steady employment and income security. And when we talk about Islamic social finance, we have to link it with the Maqasid Sharia. We have a five Maqasid Sharia, Hifzuddin, number one, pres preservation of faith, Preservation of a deen. Number two, Hifzun Nafs, uh, preservation of life. Number three, Hifzul Aqal, preservation of intellect. Number four, Hifzun Nas or Hifzun Nas, preservation of lineage or progeny. And Hifzul Mal, preservation of property. So the instruments of Islamic social finance must be linked with the uh, Maqasid uh, Sharia. And then there, there have been uh, studies to link uh, Islamic social finance with um, sustainable development goals. There are, six, uh, there are 17 sustainable development goals developed by um, UNDP, United Nations uh, Development. Um, so the 17 uh, SDGs include the, the objective of elimination of poverty. So number one is to, elim to, to eliminate poverty, zero hunger to eliminate hunger. Good health, number three, good health and well-being. Number four, quality education. Number five, gender equality. Number six, clean water and sanitation. This is very important. Even in the time of the Prophet wasallam, clean water and sanitation was one of the main objectives of the government. Uh, number seven, affordable and um, clean energy. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Number nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure. Number 10, reduced inequality. 11, sustainable cities and communities. 12, responsible consumption and production. 13, climate action. 14, life below water, 15, life on land, 16, peace and justice, strong institutions, and 17, partnerships to achieve the goal. There have been discussions on why we need to follow SDGs. Okay? Why we use Islamic social finance to, to, <coughs> to reach uh, the objective of sustainable development goals, because SDGs, you know, have been developed uh, by uh, United Nations. Why we have to follow them? 
So there have been uh, much uh, discussions and research, and uh, there are many ideas that have been put forward. And I think um, there are many Islamic juries who have come to agreement that there are some uh, objectives or goals of the SDGs which are compatible with Maqasid Sharia. So SDGs should be viewed as a part of a Maqasid Sharia. So there is nothing wrong with uh, trying to achieve some of the objectives of SDGs. Uh, in, um, in Zakat, uh, we have uh, Basnas, Badan Amil Zakat National from Indonesia, who have been uh, very active in collaborating uh, with the UNDP uh, in achieving the sustainable, goal, sustainable development goals. So I think um, Basnas have done a good job and uh, Basnas have also assisted the Indonesian government in achieving some of the sustainable development goals. In Malaysia, we have um, Kedah State uh, Zakat um, Board, Lembaga Zakat Negeri Kedah, or Kedah State Zakat Board in English, who together with uh, Basnas are trying to utilize the Zakat distribution as part of the social finance instrument uh, in order to achieve some of the uh, goals of the uh, SDGs. So I think other Zakat institutions uh, should follow and some of them are trying to learn from uh, the Basnas. Okay. So how Islamic social finance can help um, you know, respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, number one, Islamic social finance should uh, support job and income security. That is very important. That is very important because, um, yeah, we can, we can uh, give uh, food, uh, clothing to those uh, poor and needy who have been affected by the COVID-19. But if you give them cash, if you give them food, you know, tomorrow the food will be gone. The cash will be gone soon after it was used. But if you provide job, provide income security, that is called empowering people. You know, they, they feel they are empowered. People feel empowered when they are able to support themselves, when they are able to support the family. So the most important role of Islamic social finance that I want to put forward here is to support a job and uh, uh, income security. And second is to contribute to preventing poverty and unemployment. So during this uh, COVID-19, there are people who have, uh, who have uh, become poor. You know, before the COVID-19, for example, they were in the middle income earners, but because of um, uh, job uh, retrenchment, because of the loss of business, some of them fall into the category of the poor, right? So it's very important. And inshallah, we, if time permits, time is very fast. So if time permits, well, we will discuss how we can uh, utilize uh, Islamic social finance instruments to create employment and uh, to prevent uh, poverty. Oh, there are people who are waiting. Okay, wait. Okay. There are still people who are waiting to join us. Okay, ahlan wa sahlan, welcome. So, uh, to me, the third uh, role of Islamic social finance is to bolster employment opportunities, you know, create jobs, right? And create uh, economic stability and uh, create uh, social uh, stability. So Islamic 
finance, if used uh, properly, can be a powerful economic and social stabilizer. Okay. Uh, we don't have much time to talk about the uh, uh, social stabilizers. Okay. So, in the reviving the economy, the most important role of Islamic social finance is to uh, create jobs, you know, uh, provide a steady income so that people have money in their pocket. By having money in the pocket, then they can uh, expand, they can spend um, the money, okay, um, is as part of the consumption. Consumption is uh, expenditure by consumers to purchase the final goods and services. Money is very important. Money is not everything, right? Money is not everything. Okay. Um, money doesn't solve all the problems, but uh, without money, we have problems, right? So we need to uh, create a steady, uh, steady job and steady, steady flow of uh, income to the people so that they can spend. So increase in consumption will will uh, lead to higher economic activity, right? Because if there is no demand, no people, if uh, nobody buys uh, the, the, the product, nobody buys the goods and services, then there is no business, right? It's, it's as simple as that. So create jobs so that people have money, so money could be spent. So the, the, the increase in consumption will, will lead to higher economic activities. And the higher economic activities in turn will bolster employment opportunities. When, when you know, the firm sector sees that there is a potential for business, right? So they will expand the production. They will even start a new kind of business if they, if they perceive uh, there is a profit to be made in that particular, in, 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 a, in a producing that particular goods and services. So that will, in, that will uh, lead to the increase in investment. So the, what we call the circle need, need to go on. Higher spending, right? Uh, higher economic activities. Higher ec economic activities leads to higher employment, okay? And then um, uh, the higher employment, uh, you know, we will, create uh, more money. So more money means more consumption. So the, the, the what do you call it? Huh? The kitaran, uh, the circle will, will, uh, will continue. And that is how we can revive the economy. That's how we, uh, we stimulate the economy, right? The business sector needs the, the consumer sector. The consumer sector needs the, the business sector. So the two sectors uh, complement and they support each other. Okay, so now specifically, let's uh, talk about the role of zakat. Okay, wait, there are still some people waiting to be admitted, okay. Let's talk about uh, the concept of uh, zakat, right? Zakat is a religious uh, obligation which must be paid by eligible uh, Muslim uh, to those people, to those uh, asnaf, to the specific categories of the people. So zakat is a portion of wealth which must be paid to its specific uh, recipients. There are eight asnaf as mentioned uh, in the Quran.
So according to Islamic jurists, there are two types of properties, Amwalu Zahira and Amwalu Batina. So Amwalu Zahira or the apparent properties are properties that can be easily observed by public, and especially by the Amil, okay, such as agricultural products and livestock. And Amwalul Batina or the non-apparent properties are properties which are not ready, readily, which are not readily observable by Amil or by the public. So why I mention about this? This is uh, very important for us to understand because there are some um, misunderstanding or misconception about where to pay zakat. Okay. Um, according to Imam An-Nawawi, uh, he gave the fatwa that uh, Amwal Zahira must be paid to the government and Amwal Batina could be paid directly to Asna. However, according to Dr. Yusuf Fawdawi, both types of uh, properties, whether apparent properties or non-apparent properties, must be paid to the government or to the zakat institution because it is the responsibility of the zakat institution to distribute the money it's not the responsibility of zakat payers to distribute the money directly directly to us now um, in in my research um, i found and revealed that there are still some people who because of certain factors, they pay directly to, to Asna. So uh, this makes the Zakat uh, institution uh, less effective because, because uh, in order to help the Asna, Zakat institutions need enough uh, Zakat funds uh, to go around all the Asna, right? So it's, we have to have the paradigm shift. This is the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And uh, the zakat payers should be made to understand that um, it's, it's, it's time, you know, it's, it's time to pay zakat. There are certain Islamic jurists who talk about the uh, acceleration of zakat payment. Um, whether zakat can be paid in advance and there is a, they came to con some some of the islamic jurists came to the conclusion that uh, it is permissible for zakat payers to pay for example next year's zakat this year okay to pay forward we call the acceleration of zakat payment and i think um, based on the research that i've done the most important thing is to increase the zakat compliance. In Indonesia, for example, according to Basnas, yeah, zakat collected in Indonesia is less than 5% of the potential zakat collection. Can you imagine? Yeah. Zakat collection, the actual zakat collection is less than 5% of the potential zakat collection. That is the issue, yeah? Many people still are not compliant. Either they don't pay zakat or they pay directly to asnaf or they pay half of the zakat, which make the zakat collection fall far behind the actual, oh, sorry, uh, fall far behind the potential uh, zakat collection. If the zakat collection can reach the potential, right, a lot can be done. Yeah, a lot can be done to help those people. Mr. Shah Irada, are you following us? Yes, yes. Uh, you're telling about zakat. Absolutely, I agree with that point of view. Like even, you know, like in Pakistan, in uh, Malaysia, in other countries, what I have realized that uh, I'm just sharing my uh, point of view. Like uh, 
you know the the people like uh, who should be paying the zakat i think 5% of those people pay the zakat you are 100% correct and even the amount they should be paying they don't pay that much amount they pay much lesser even the people who are paying the zakat they pay much le lesser uh, the amount they should be paying you are 100% correct if zakat is really uh collected in a proper manner the way it should be collected i don't think so that muslim country or the muslim community will be suffering from poverty or there will be a shortage of money or if it, during the pandemic time during any time of crisis uh there may be uh i don't think so there there should not be left anything so that you cannot help a zakat is the really a big thing if it is collected and uh, with honesty it is done. Uh, I think you are hundred percent correct. I agree with that point. Yes, thank you for sharing. You know, I have a dream. You know, that someday uh, zakat uh, will be able uh, the amount of zakat will reach its potential, and zakat institutions can. Um, contribute to the elimination of poverty. Just like at the time of Omar Ibn Aziz, you know, everybody has money. So that, you know, there's no, no one who, who are qualified to be the, the recipients of zakat. That means the economy was, was uh, doing very well. So, so I have a dream that, you know, even if we, we cannot reach that level, at least uh, we have, uh, we will be able to, to help those poor and needy. We, have, we can find ways to help them get out of the poverty so that they will contribute zakat instead of being the recipients of zakat. Yeah, yeah, you are correct, 100% correct. Inshallah, your dream, your dream will come true, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. So currently there is the issue of low compliance of zakat, right? So, so, uh, the, the, we, we must plan uh, strategies and implement, uh, uh, you know, suitable policies of uh, to to increase the zakat uh, collection uh, in the future because zakat can be used as a, as an important uh, Islamic social finance. Uh, like I said before, there is a need for acceleration of the payment of zakat. You know, some, some people, they, they keep postponing. Okay, I will pay zakat next year. I will pay zakat next month. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that is correct. The people always have some, yeah, look for some excuses not to pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a need for paradigm shift. There is a need for, for acceleration of the payments of zakat, you know. For example, I mean, I mean, the people should believe, like, believe me, if they pay in the ra, in the in the path of God, the amount much increase. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? They get like at least ten times more than that what they pay in the ra of Allah. But there should be a belief. I mean, they should believe in it. So yes. that is the thing. You're right. Yeah, you, you are right because zakat means increase. Zakat means barakah. So, yeah, zakat means riba. Yeah, increase. That's your right, correct. Yeah. So. No, sorry, sorry. Uh, not riba. Zakat means like, uh, uh, like that is interest means riba. Zakat means yeah, when you pay something in the ra, ra of God, ya Allah, subhanahu. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That means increase. That means barakah. You know, that there, there is a. Uh, one uh, true story. There are there are two businessmen. One who is uh, who always pays zakat, and then uh, the one who who did not pay zakat. So they they are two brothers, right? This is a true story. I don't want to mention the name. Two two brothers. So one brother is doing. The two brothers uh, they were doing business, right? One did not pay zakat. One paid zakat. This is a true story. And then the one who did not pay zakat, although you know the uh, he was uh, making profit, you know sometimes he felt sick, sometimes you know he had to spend a lot on the uh, medical expenses. This is true story, and in the end he, you know, uh, there's no barakah. Although he made profit, you know he he had to pay a lot for other expenses like medical expenses. 
And the other brother, the, the younger brother, okay, he, he always paid zakat on time. And he was always healthy. So he had, you know, barakah. So the, he, he, he had uh, extra money. You know, he, he did not feel, he did not feel sick. You know, so so that he did not have to pay too much for for the uh, medical cost. So, so in in reality, he he is richer than his older brother because uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, correct, correct, yeah, right. Although the older brother, you know, maybe may maybe earning the same amount of uh, profit, but he needed you know to pay a lot for the medical cost because he was always sick. <laughs> yeah, that is the barakat, you know, that is butter, that is blessing barakat. Yeah, yeah that, that is, these are the things that save your money. So, and then yeah. barakat, put it, yes. So barakat come in many forms. Sometimes we didn't, uh, we, you know, we, we couldn't see. Barakat comes in the form of uh, good health, you know, good family, you know, so. So in, in, in the case of zakat, uh, there is an issue of um, low zakat collection. And uh, the, because of that, the distribution of zakat is not enough to, to cover all the asna, right? So a lot can be done using the zakat distribution. However, because of the low collection, a lot cannot, there are not much, uh, a lot, there, there's not much uh, that uh, can be done. And uh, I wish the zakat collection could be improved so that a lot more could be done using the zakat fund. And there are issues, um, you know, some experts talk about uh, how we should uh, redefine certain um, terms regarding asna, fi sabili lahu fi sabili you know, fi riqab. Okay, so so we don't have time to talk about these um, issues. All right, so we move on. So zakat plays an uh, important role in promoting a more equitable distribution of wealth, while also creating a sense of solidarity among the Muslims. And uh, so the role of zakat is to provide social welfare and build social capital in civil society using the zakat collected from the eligible Muslims. Uh, there are certain countries who made it, who make it mandatory to pay zakat, in, including Malaysia. And it says here, according to Pakistan, Libya, uh, in the case of Malaysia, Pakistan, Libya, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Yemen. But all, <coughs> in the case of Malaysia, although Zakat is made compulsory, and our national fatwa have come to consensus that uh, income zakat is compulsory for Muslims. However, uh, in reality, it, the, the law is quite weak and the law enforcement uh, is non existent. So that, you know, even if the eligible Muslims don't pay, don't pay zakat, there is no enforcement, no punishment against them. So that's why the uh, zakat collection is, is still very low. Okay. Uh, that, yeah, that is the one of the main reason you are correct. I mean, for the for the low collections. Yes. So because there is no enforcement, unlike the tax when you know, if, if you don't pay tax, the uh, IRS will, will send you a love letter. There was, you know, some kind of warning, and uh, consequently, you'll be taken certain actions, including the punishment, and you'll be charged in court according to certain act. All right. So let's uh, let's move on. We are running out of time. Eh? Okay. So I think. Um, we need to have a paradigm shift among those eligible to pay zakat. What I mean is people <coughs> who are eligible to pay zakat, the surplus people, people having surplus wealth. The, now is the time to, to pay zakat because there are other people who are in need of zakat. Okay. 
And the second point I want to make is zakat could be used creatively to create business opportunities. So instead of zakat uh, given as a form of cash, right, uh, in the form of food, right, so that that's good. That uh, that is commendable. But in the long term, you know, we have to find and 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 develop ways of how zakat can be used to create business, give people uh, employment opportunities, give people uh, business opportunities, such as giving us enough capital funds to start, start up uh, small businesses. And Sadaqah is uh, another uh, so Islamic social finance instrument. Uh, Sadaqah is a volunteer voluntary charity you know it's not an obligation however sadaqa is uh, very important so uh, i seen uh, there are some individual in malaysia we have uh, ustaz abid liu you know ustaz abid liu so whenever there are people in need people in need of accommodation people in need of food people who are in trouble, people, uh, you know, who are inflicted be, with a certain uh, misfortune, he will be there. He will be there. Ustaz Abid Liu. He will be there to give charities to the people. So I think it's incre incredible what he has done. I wish we could have more Abid Liu uh, in Malaysia. So, because a charity can play a very important role, okay, during this time. Sadaqah or charity is flexible in terms of the amount of sadaqah. Everybody can give sadaqah, right? You can, you can give sadaqah. Okay, right now I'm giving you sadaqah. Mr. Sheikh Irada. Yeah, yes, sir. you are 100%. Every good deed is supposed to be a sadaka, and uh, it is recommended that you should start your day as the prophet wasalam, said you should start your day with a sadaka. so so of course every sort of good like if when you pay in the in the path of allah that is a sadaka. when you speak a good words to someone when you do something good to some for someone that these are all sadaqat so you yeah. are correct. I agree with that point. Yeah, giving good words is sadaqa. Giving good advice is sadaqa. Smiling is also sadaqa. So I'm, I'm smiling. So I give you sadaqa. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, that's correct. And even I would like to add one thing. More. <coughs> sure. Look at the uh, budget, the charity. You were earlier talking about the charity organization. If you look the big charity organization, like there are a couple of big, big organization in the world uh, who just run the charity work, international, European. Uh, if you look at their budget, you will be surprised. Their budget is in billions of dollars. So That's charity is so, is so, I mean, yeah, of course. So for cancer research, for there are different sort of, uh, for different sort of uh, disease, there are big charity organizations and they have the budget in billions of dollars. So of course, if charity and sadaqa can play a very big role uh, for the welfare of the Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, for the prosperity of the society, you are 100% correct. I, I agree with your point of view. And uh, Allah, you know, guarantees the reward in the hereafter for those who give a charity, you know, yeah, Allah will, will reward with, with paradise. So if everybody can have this uh, paradigm shift, you know, they have to uh, understand that, that uh, there is a big reward in the hereafter. And uh, it's not difficult to, to give sadaqa. You can give whatever you have. It doesn't have to be 1,000. It doesn't have to be 1 million. It can be one ringgit, it can be two ringgit. So, so anybody, any any amount that you can uh, you can uh, give sadaqa. So, let's all give sadaqa, because yeah. sadaqa yeah. is flexible, right? You can you can give sadaqa anytime, any amount. That's correct. Uh, and to God, 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the amount doesn't matter. Your intention, your niyat. Yeah. So your niyat uh, is, is how pure it is. That matters to Allah. That's right. That's right. So, so everybody should contribute to sadaqah in some way. You know, everybody should uh, and everybody could contribute to sadaqah. That's what we have to understand. So everybody can play a role. Every one of us can give to sadaqah. So inshallah, well, we'll talk about sukuk uh, because of the time. I think uh, I'm going to skip the sukuk part because we, we have more slides to go. Oh, I think we are in trouble. We don't have time to talk uh, about all the, the instruments that I want to talk about. So I will skip the sukuk. So I'll go to Islamic crowdfunding. So what is Islamic crowdfunding? Islamic crowdfunding is a Sharia compliant financing option, right? That includes funding a project with funds sourced from a group of investors in favor of Muslim borrowers and where the funding campaign and related transactions are done through an Islamic crowdfunding site or platform which follows Islamic principles. Okay, so when we talk about Islamic um, crowdfunding, uh, we have to understand that it is a, a combination of the technology of crowdfunding because in order uh, to participate in crowdfunding, we need to have what we call crowdfunding crowdfunding site or crowdfunding a platform. And um, uh, crowdfunding also is a combination of technology and the principles of fiqh, a mu'amalat. We have to find out the, the, the concepts which are permissible, which concepts uh, which are not permissible and also the modern contracts of the Islamic uh, finance industry. Let's look at uh, the types of Islamic crowdfunding. There are basically, there are many types. And um, I want to mention the four types of crowdfunding. Number one is Islamic donation-based crowdfunding. In the Islamic donation-based crowdfunding, donors donate small amounts for a non-profit project or for any social development initiative without expecting any financial return. They just expect, you know, reward in the hereafter. So donors do not expect any financial return in this world. So that is called the Islamic donation-based crowdfunding. The second type is Islamic rewards-based crowdfunding. So the donors uh, contribute the small amount of money to to build a, to to launch a project, um, and then the reward is the product generated by the project. And for small project, the reward can be you know a shirt, a CD, or a movie, something like that. Uh, you know, so I would suggest that we, uh, you know, we can um, uh, develop this uh, crowdfunding um, by by participating uh, in the crowdfunding uh, platform. There are there are several crowdfunding platform that that we can contribute. And the third type is Islamic equity. Crowdfunding investors give a big amount, substantial amounts of cash and equity injectors by investing and become the shareholders and share the profit and loss. So the, in this Islamic equity crowdfunding, the investors are large uh, businesses who contribute a substantial amount of money. And uh, the fourth is Islamic debt crowdfunding. Uh, so Islamic debt crowdfunding is a Sharia compliant 
debt crowdfunding, where lenders give a loan and expect to get paid the principal and the profit. So I think the first two is the, the easiest. So even students can, can participate in this. Um, okay, so Sharia compliant crowdfunding is a financing mechanism where cash is raised from a number of people using a platform in compliance with the rules of Sharia. It links investors with entrepreneurs. So it, 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 is a, it provides the link between those people who want to invest and also those people who want to do the business. So Islamic crowdfunding, of course, it, it follows the principles of Islamic finance and uh, it encourages cooperation among a large number of people to, to invest for a project or, or for a business. So this is in line with the Sharia principle, you know, that the surplus resources are to be transferred to sectors with the lack of wealth. The surplus give to the, the deficit uh, unit. Okay, so we have the P2P Islamic crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer Islamic crowdfunding, uh, which uh, provides a platform for those seeking an alternative to the conventional P2P crowdfunding. So P2P Islamic crowdfunding can offer a potentially higher degree of returns because there is no fixed uh, return interest involved and more importantly risks are shared across the board in the pursuit of the productive uh, process um, so today we have uh, islamic crowd crowdfunding platforms such as ethis crowd and ethis crowd uh, have the aim of providing affordable housing for low-income families this is the operation of the ATIS uh, uh, Islamic crowdfunding. Uh, okay, so next uh, we talk about the concept of Wakaf. Um, there are three uh, characteristics of Wakaf irrevocability, perpetuity, and inalienability. So, one of the issues is um, um perpetuity right so irre irrevocability means once the founder creates the work of he or she cannot take it back right and the perpetuity means once the work of is created it must be perpetual okay it must be perpetual and it cannot be temporary so and the third characteristic is uh, inalienability once the property is treated as walk-off, no one can become the owner of the walk-off because, because the owner of the walk-off, the, the true owner of the walk-off is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so um, because of that, uh, walk-off cannot be subject to any gift. It cannot be sold. It cannot be inherited. So the issue that some experts are, are discussing is can we use temporary walk walk off? So, for for example, we have a piece of land. We want to contribute to walk off for ten years. Can we do that? Actually, there are uh, you know many opinions on this one. And according to uh, Madhab um, Maliki, uh, temporary cash is allowed. And I think um, in the case of walk off. Or in, in the case of Islamic finance instruments, for example, we are not binded by any madhab, right? So we take into account um, all these um, madhabs. We are not binded by any particular madhab in the case of Islamic social finance and in the case of Islamic finance. So, um, we follow all the uh, all the opinions of the madhab and we take the best whatever is uh, whatever suits to achieve the uh, maslaha of the ummah 
So we, we should uh, accept, right? So I think we, we, we should not be part of the problem. We should be part of the solutions. Whatever is good for the Ummah, it should be, it should be implemented, right? We are part of the solution. So like we said before, Islamic social finance has many instruments, including uh, zakat, sadaqa, waqaf, Islamic crowdfunding, sukuk, and Islamic microfinance. So we have talked about zakat, we have talked, uh, on, we have talked about uh, zakat, sadaqa, uh, Islamic uh, crowdfunding, and, and sukuk, and uh, waqaf, right? So Waqaf is an important Islamic social finance instrument that has played an important role since the early years of the Islamic government. So for example, during the time of the Prophet وسلم, Sayyidina Osman ibn Affan has um, uh, contributed um, uh, a well, right? He, he bought a well from a Jewish trader, and then later on he contributed uh, his well as part of Waqaf. And until today, there is a Uthman Ibn uh, Affan Foundation, which has been run um, uh, successfully. Uh, okay, so part part of the Waqaf is invested into real estate, into um, land, into agricultural sector, where the, the profit is given to beneficiaries, and part of it is returned back as, uh, as, uh, as capital for future projects. So yes, and uh, uh, the, the foundation of Uthman Ibn Affan is one of the example which uh, shows that Waqaf can be used as an important social finance instrument. Okay, we are almost done. So the mechanism of Waqaf is very relevant and a dynamic approach in solving some of the present problems faced by not only the Muslim Ummah, but also the global, global society in general. So Waqaf can be used uh, not only for Muslims, but also for non-Muslims during, during this uh, uh, crisis time. So the purpose of Waqaf is to encourage individuals who are well-to-do in society to voluntarily donate some of the properties whether movable properties or immovable, or immovable properties for general purpose or for some specific purpose. And um, right now, there are many studies who put forward cash walk-off as one of the alternatives to the country, to the purpose of helping the poor. So in Malaysia, cash walk-off was flourishing and uh, its implementation has been noticed uh, by the public and cash walk-off has a great potential to boost the country's economy and develop the community. Fund collected through cash walk-off certificate program can be allocated to social related uh, developments such as education, health, infrastructure, and a poverty alleviation program during this COVID-19. That, that is what uh, should be done. So, uh, Waqaf uh, promotes mutual help. Ta'awanu ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al-ismi wa al-udwan. So we should help each other during this uh, a crucial time and uh, walk off is one of the instruments where you know those people who have surplus of money can voluntarily 
uh, donate some of them to walk off institutions. So this uh, culture of helping each other encourages the wealthier to always remember the poorer and lead them to contribute the money to walk off fund. And hopefully the walk off fund uh, would be able to assist those affected by this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Cash walk-off should play a significant role in uh, financing uh, micro and medium-sized enterprise. And um, cash walk-off model is meant to develop and enhance the financial services for micro and medium-sized enterprises. Starting uh, next month, inshallah, our team will embark on a project on how to develop a uh, cash walk-off model in order to help those uh, small and medium uh, scale enterprises. Uh, cash walk-off, uh, I think, has a potential to improve uh, the economic growth, to stimulate an economy uh, by um, uh, creating uh, business opportunities and creating uh, the employment opportunities uh, by providing the the access to capital to the SMEs, you know, the the creation of small and medium enterprises will create the uh, employment and this we create uh, or, or improve the um, purchasing power of the people, which uh, will lead to the increase in consumption. And, and uh, increase in investment and increase in the economic activities, thus uh, stimulate and revive the economy during this COVID-19. All right, so um, actually there are many walk-off models that have been uh, implemented in different countries. Um, number one is the uh, walk-off scheme shares uh, emerge in Malaysia, Indonesia, Kuwait, and the UK. This is uh, called walk-off scheme shares where the uh, donors um, contribute to the walk-off fund and the mutawalli will uh, invest the, uh, the walk-off fund to uh, certain project and part of the profits from the project uh, will be donated to beneficiaries such as hospitals um, and uh, the poor and the needy and others. And the second uh, walk-off scheme is deposit cash walk-off scheme practice in Singapore, Bahrain and South Africa. The third is compulsory cash walk-off scheme, which is a public walk-off practice in Singapore. So this is a unique in Singapore. There is a compulsory cash walk-off scheme. And uh, there is a corporate walk-off scheme practice in Malaysia, Turkey, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. A cooperative uh, walk-off scheme practice in Uzbekistan and deposit product uh, walk-off scheme, uh, which is a public walk-off that has been practiced by two banks in Bangladesh, the Social Investment Bank Limited and the Islamic Bank Bangladesh Limited. So I think uh, some of these uh, models could be utilized uh, in, uh, by, by some uh, countries, by some states in order to help those uh, affected during this COVID-19. And of course they have to go through uh, certain procedures like in Malaysia, uh, Jauhar, Jauhar, um, our institution which governs the activity of walk off has uh, produced the instruction manuals of walk off. So, anybody, when we talk about walk off, uh, you have to, in Malaysia, you have to go through certain procedure and you have to register at the respective state religious 
uh, State Islamic Religious Council of uh, of East States. We have 14 uh, State Islamic Religious Councils in Malaysia. So Wakaf uh, can be, um, you know, can be um, quite a pro problematic in the sense that uh, you have to uh, follow the, the procedure, yeah. This is an example of the walk-off shares scheme where contributors, whether individuals or corporations, they buy walk-off shares and the religious institution or NGOs acting as a mutawalli or trustee, uh, they give uh, walk-off, the cash walk-off certificate and the investment from the walk-off fund is invested and uh, the profits is distributed to beneficiaries such as schools, or hospitals, training centers, uh, and others. And there is a walk of Slango Muamalat, which has been uh, practiced uh, in Malaysia, which was launched in 2012, right? And the uh, Waqif Bank in Turkey is one of the most uh, successful Waqif funded banks in the world. Okay. So Waqif Bank is uh, a conventional banking, uh, which is involved in interest uh, bearing banking activities, however. But um, uh, it is called the Waqif Bank because um, more than 60% of the fund is funded by Wokov. So other countries could, uh, could, could replicate this uh, model of Wokov Bank. Only the improvement to be made is to make the bank as the Sharia or compliant bank. Okay, we don't have much time left. So this is the Wokov Bank in uh, Turkey. And uh, last but not least, the instrument of um, Islamic uh, microfinance. So Islamic uh, microfinance uh, complies with the principles of Islam and in, involves in projects of uh, halal or permissible by Sharia. And the project must be charitable or helping to develop the economy of a country so in today's world, um, it was reported that Islamic microfinance would help 650 million Muslims throughout the world who have less than, who have earned less than $2, $2 a day and give them access to financial assistance. However, in recent, in, in, in recent years, the Islamic microfinance throughout the world continues to struggle to, to grow. So there is a need to plan, strategize, and implement suitable policies to make the Islamic microfinance um, important again, because you know, it, it, could be, it could be used as a powerful tool to help those people in need. The advantage of Islamic microfinance is unlike the uh, other finance, those people who, who apply for the microfinance, uh, you know, they don't have the, they, they don't have to follow the strict rules like uh, to apply for other finance like housing or, or personal financing. So, so, it gives the advantage to those people who who are not working in the in the what do you call the formal uh, uh, employment sector who don't have pay slip, you know. So it could help those uh, people who you know who are not qualified to apply for other loans, so that they could use the money uh, to to. A start up small business. 
So the most, I think the, the most important characteristic of microfinance is it must, it must give the called uh, Hassan, the benevolent loan. Means if you give them 10,000, they pay back 10,000, called the Hassan. So I think that is the most uh, challenging part because no bank, no bank will, will give, uh, you know, uh, 10,000 and get back 10,000. They, they need to make a profit. But I think that the financial institutions institutions although they are the profit making institutions yeah we cannot deny islamic banks are profit making uh, institutions but uh, i think there, there there must be some uh, kind of awareness um, that you know as uh, as an islamic uh, institutions uh, yes they can make profit right but also there is other there are other responsibilities like helping other people so that is a challenge for for islamic um, banking institutions right uh, not only to make profits but also to help others all right so lastly uh, i want to talk about the um, islamic social finance and the importance of fintech or financial technology innovation. All the Islamic social finance that we talked about today, zakat, suku, wakaf, right? Islamic microfinance, uh, Islamic crowdfunding, okay? Can support SMEs, right? So hopefully they can support SMEs, they can provide uh, jobs, you know, so so ensure the flow of income, and um, in Malaysia, the Malaysian government is driving the digital economy forward to become a nation of sustainable growth. So we have Malaysian Digital Economy Cooperation (MDEC) or MDEC aims to ensure the digital economy by emphasizing three primaries, empowering Malaysians with digital skills, enabling digitally powered business and driving digital investment. So I think during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, it's, it's very important that, that people are equipped with their digital skills, right? People uh, will be able to do the business with a digitally powered business, okay? And there is a, a need to increase investment in the digital, in the industries using a digital innovation. Because, you know, the um, FinTech is very important. Even in the management of Zakat, in the management of Suku, in the management of WACA, microfinance, crowdfunding, it, it, is, it is crucial. Unfortunately, uh, we are running short of time to, to talk about the importance of FinTech in, um, as an instrument in helping the other instruments of the Islamic social finance. Inshallah, in another session, we, we can talk about it. So this is an, an example of the use of FinTech in uh, Zakat management. So FinTech could be used in the Zakat collection, okay? Using a mobile phone, card reader, and uh, also in crowdfunding. And distribution, peer-to-peer, -peer, mobile payment, e-wallet, digital currency, and uh, Asnaf Pruno marketplace in the distribution. Um, and data management also, um, like in Kedah, we have Zakat on touch, which shows the real time data analysis and uh, cloud computing and big data. This is very important to, to, to make a Zakat distribution as 
transparent as possible to increase the confidence of the zakat payers. Okay, we are towards the end. This is an example of a zakat on touch when we can see the real life uh, zakat, the real life data on zakat uh, collection and zakat instrument. Okay, so in conclusion, um, Islamic social finance instruments uh, such as zakat, sadaqah, waqaf, Suku Islamic microfinance and Islamic crowdfunding should be utilized and there is a need to plan, strategize and implement suitable uh, models, suitable measures in order to use this uh, Islamic social finance instrument to stimulate and revive the economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. So these uh, instruments of Islamic social finance need to be mobilized sooner rather than later to revive the economy during this COVID-19 pandemic. And these instruments such as zakat, sadaqa, and waqaf should play significant and important roles not only during but also uh, post a pandemic which is uh, expected to follow uh, and uh, hopefully it could help uh, stimulate the economy uh, because uh, we are, the experts are expecting the recession uh, following the pandemic. So, and uh, social investments uh, such as Sukuk, uh, Islamic microfinance and Islamic crowdfunding should be mobilized where everybody should take, uh, uh, some, some people, some people should take initiatives to to launch the projects based on, for example, Islamic crowdfunding. And hopefully there'll be a, a huge participation from the public and, and a strong support from the public uh, to support these uh, instruments because uh, these instruments are very powerful in order to help those affected by the COVID-19. And of course, there is a need for further research in this fertile area of research. We as academicians, we do, we do uh, research, we do writing and we present papers. So this is what we call the fertile area of research. And uh, lastly, last but not least, uh, I think uh, there is a need for non-linear thinking, uh, thinking that there are many solutions to the problem and we should be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And we can think creatively out of the box. Um, unfortunately, in this session, uh, we don't have time to put forward um, a few uh, creative thinking and out of the box thinking and because of the constraint of time and everybody should have a paradigm shift means that we should think of uh, not only ourselves but also of helping uh, other people so we everybody could and uh, should contribute to help each other okay with that uh, note um, uh, thank you for participating in this uh, Islamic finance lecture series. This is our sixth series. Um, so there, there is a question and answer uh, session that follows. And uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank, Thank you very much, Professor. It's really been a very knowledgeable and full of knowledge. Thank you very much uh, for your precious time, for your precious knowledge. It's really benefited us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Doctor. Prof. So I, I give back to I return back to Dr. Tohe. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you many, many thank you to uh, Associate Professor Dr. Yusuf Ayusman. Uh, 
she gives uh, many ideas for us about the Islamic social finance. Inshallah, uh, for those who are, uh, I mean, participate in this uh, program, I also uh, would like to thank a, a lot of uh, you to, to give your uh, so time to stay with us almost uh, two hours. Okay. Inshallah, we will meet uh, again uh, next month on the topic of. Uh, 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 we call Almal Management. Almal Management. Uh, from the uh, outsiders or from the corporate person who uh, are as uh, CEO, inshallah, uh, next month on the 24th of March, okay, at the same time. Inshallah, we will meet uh, again next month for, for today. I have to stop here first and thank you very much for all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam by reciting Surah Al Asri and then Tasbih Kafara. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa al Asri inna al insan tuku illa ladina amanu inna salahat wa tawasal bil haq wa tawasal bil sab. Allah bahamdika. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.